There are various kinds of insulation on the market. You've got your fibrous insulations, whether that be sheep's wool, rock wool, fiberglass. You've then got foam insulation, rigid foam insulation with foil either side of it, polystyrene, which are both expanded and extruded polystyrenes, cellulose, blown cellulose, which is recycled newspaper. You've got spray foams. You've also got the multifoil products, which work on a reflective basis rather than being a thick product giving a thermal resistance, all doing the same thing, preventing heat from escaping from within a building or keeping buildings cool in warm climates. But with all insulations, their performance is only as good as the person who puts it in. If you don't fit things properly, they're not going to work to the extent to which the manufacturers prescribe. Fiberglass is probably the most common insulation used within the construction industry. It is relatively cheap, relatively cheap to install and can be done by a DIYer with no real skill. You have to cut those products accurately or you have to seal them. A lecturer at a recent home building renovating show who quoted a figure from NASA who had insulated all their buildings and wondered why they weren't performing properly. And the speaker said that NASA came to the conclusion that a 5% gap around insulation reduces the performance by 50%. Effectiveness of insulation is measured in what's called the R value or the thermal resistance or the conductivity is measured in the K value or the lambda value. Now these are laboratory figures that are produced by what's called an apparatus called a hot box. Where they have a hot plate, they place the insulation in a box over that hot plate and then measure the temperature differential or how long it takes the heat from the hot plate to reach the other side of the insulation. So the lower the lambda value or the K value, the better insulator that product is deemed to be. But that is a laboratory test, not a real life scenario. So even though you can have a really good thermal resistance, you might not experience that in real life if the product isn't installed properly. Spray foam insulation is basically a two-part component material which are mixed at the tip of a spray gun. Now there's two types of spray foam. There's a closed cell foam and an open cell foam. The main difference between them, as the name suggests, is that the closed cell foam, the cell structure is closed and the cells are full of gas. The open cell foam has an open cell structure and the cells are full of air. The thermal performance of the two varies because the gas in the closed cell foam has a better thermal resistance than the air in the open cell foam. Physically, closed cell foams tend to be rigid and hard. Open cell foams are soft and flexible. But the primary benefits of spray foam over other options are speed of installation, and the actual installation itself. You don't have to cut the spray foam to fit in awkward shapes. If you've got hips or valleys in a roof and you're installing other products in there, you don't have to cut them to awkward shapes to fit. You can just spray and it expands to the parameters to which it's sprayed. So the benefits are tremendous. Also, the speed of installation is unbelievable. You could spend two or three days cut in to fit a 50 square metre loft, that will be done in a couple of hours with spray foam. There's a distinct difference between air tightness and breathability. Air tightness means that you're stopping air movement through a structure or a product. Breathability means that you are still allowing moisture vapour diffusion. So the product has the ability to allow moisture vapour from a moist environment to pass through that product to a drier environment. So lime mortar on traditional buildings allows moisture migration through it to the outside atmosphere. 
open cell spray foams, so they allow moisture vapour to pass through them to the outside of the structure. Likewise, if the wind was blowing, it wouldn't pass through your lime mortar. Similarly, when the wind blows, it doesn't pass through the spray foam. Open cell foams are much more vapour open or breathable than closed cell foams. The contractor will come out to the house, do a free of charge survey, look at the areas to be sprayed and should honestly tell you whether it's suitable or not. Just because you want to use spray foam doesn't mean that it's suitable for your application. They'll look at the area to be sprayed, they'll do a U-value or should do a U-value calculation and a condensation risk analysis to give peace of mind but also to satisfy the building inspector and any potential purchasers of the property. Then they'll agree a price with you. If you accept that price, they will come and do the installation. The only equipment that comes into the building is the heated hose with the spray gun and the sprayer and his labourer. They will come into the house, they will mask off areas that need to be protected from any overspray. The sprayer will just work his way through the building, spraying, ensuring everything is well sealed. When you're looking for a supplier of spray foam, look for one that's accredited by a manufacturer. Then you'll know that they've been trained by that manufacturer and inspected by that manufacturer. The manufacturer should monitor his installers so that he does quality assurance checks on them, have a regular rapport with the installer so he knows what's going on. If you're doing a new build project and you want U-value calculation, they should be able to provide them. And I would also say that they should also do a condensation risk analysis. When I do U-value calculations, I always do a condensation risk analysis. So you know whether a vapour control layer, as is with any insulation, whether you know, need a vapour control layer or not, is determined by that condensation risk analysis. Spray foam can be used many different projects, whether it commercial, industrial, housing project or just a one-off self-build project, restoration project, passive house. We can use spray foam in any of those applications. There may be different foams that are used in those applications, but spray foam is quite a broad brush and you can use it in probably any application. You can spray onto any material. Unfortunately, spray foam sticks to everything, um, so you, that's why we have to mask. But you can spray onto any material as long as it's clean and dry. There are no issues. We can be spray in roofs, in walls. There are derivatives of the foam which are called pore fill, which can be used in cavity walls. We've actually used a pore fill version of the open cell foam behind lath and plaster in um, traditional buildings in Scotland. Passive houses are built to a high level of insulation and a high level of air tightness. So spray foam can give you both the insulation and your air tightness in one application. If you're using a different material, you'd have to use lots of tapes and membranes to get that air tightness. So you can get really, really high levels of air tightness. But one thing I will say, if you're dealing with passive levels of air tightness, you have to look at ventilating the building properly. Because you're making it airtight, you cannot ignore the need for clean air within that building. So you must look at mechanical heat recovery ventilation or some other form of ventilation to make sure that the air quality within the building is maintained. Spray foam, you're usually looking at the lifetime of the building to which it's sprayed. The only thing that will degrade spray foam is exposure to UV light. So if the foam is going to be in a position where it can be exposed to UV light, 
it should be painted with a simple water-based emulsion and that will stop the degradation. Rigid board insulation and closed cell foam insulation have intrinsically a gas within the cells of the foam. Over time, that gas leaks out of the cells in the foam. So you will get a slight diminishing in performance. It will never come down to the level of an open cell foam, but that doesn't mean open cell foams don't perform well. The beauty of an open cell foam is that it maintains its level of thermal resistance constantly throughout its lifetime. Because it's full of air, it doesn't change. Isonine on their 25th anniversary opened a building up that they did when they first started production. They tested the foam and it had all the same properties it had when it was sprayed 25 years earlier. I think the construction industry has a reluctance to use spray foam. I will say that once contractors have used the product, they realize the benefits. And once we've um, installed the foam on projects, we get repeat custom all the time from uh, builders. The installation costs of spray foam can seem expensive because it's an installed cost. So you're getting your labor and your materials. So if you're just thinking of that in relation to buying other forms of insulation, you have to factor the labour in on those other forms of insulation. So even though initially it might seem an expensive install, we are very, very cost effective because it doesn't take long to do it. So traditionally, if you're thinking of rigid board insulation, we were probably more or less on par for installation time, but the level of air tightness that you get means that you don't have to spend time then looking at the membranes and tapes. If you are thinking of fiberglass insulation or fibrous insulations, then that is probably cheaper, but you won't get the same level of air tightness that you would get using a spray foam.